Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar hosted by Eurocities and Julie's Bicycle through the ROC EU funded project. For your information, we are recording, recording this webinar and uh, we will make the video available in a couple of days. You will be able to view it again uh, and share it if you want on the ROC YouTube channel. So before we start with today's topic uh, about the city as a living lab, uh, some housekeeping information just to make sure everybody can use the GoToWebinar uh, all right. So you can find several icons on your GoToWebinar panel. You can see, for instance, a little hand. Uh, if you can click on this little hand icon just to make sure you can hear me OK, if everybody can do that. Yes, perfect. Uh, it's all working, that's good. There is another icon, uh, it's asking questions. So you can use this to ask questions in the Q&A that we will take at the end uh, of, the, of the conversation. And you can also use it to flag the issues you are having during the webinar, if you have any issues. We will monitor uh, this panel. Uh, if you accidentally click on the X in the dialog box, you will be taken out of the webinar, but you can rejoin by just following the link in the confirmation email you received. So all seems to work fine for everybody. Uh, so just before we start, a bit about us and why we are here together this morning. Uh, as I said, this webinar is presented by Eurocities together with Julie's Bicycle. So Eurocities is a network of major European cities founded in 1986. We are based in uh, Brussels. Oh, I forgot to change the slides. Welcome. Yes. Uh, yes, we represent more than 140 cities all over Europe and our objective is to reinforce the important role that local governments should play in multi-governance structures. Um, Julie's Bicycle is a charity based in London that supports the creative community to act on climate change and environmental sustainability. Together with 30 other organizations, uh, Eurocities and Julie's Bicycles are partners in the ROC project, which is a project financed by the Horizon 2020 program of the European Union. So ROC stands for Regeneration and Optimization of Cultural Heritage in Creative and Knowledge Cities, as you can see on my screen. Uh, in this project, we are considering cultural heritage in its very wide definition as a tool for urban regeneration and we are testing a circular model of transformation of historic city centers in 10 European cities, including the city of Eindhoven, who acts as a role model city in the project, and we will present uh, some initiatives today. We put together this program of webinars to inform the audience about the ROC project and the different topics we are working on, because uh, ROC aims to demonstrate how cultural historical city centers can become laboratories to test new models of urban regeneration and therefore leading the urban transition. So ROC has developed a new approach combining technical, organizational and social innovations to move from a linear to a more circular urban regeneration model. And uh, collaborative regeneration initiatives are part of this approach. And today we will discuss living labs as an innovative approach to governance. So first I will just give you a few introduction introduction information about what are living labs. So according to the European network of living labs, living labs are defined as uh, user-centered open innovation ecosystems based on a systematic user co-creation approach, integrating research and innovation processes in real life communities and settings. Basically, this means that living labs uh, are developing products or processes to find solutions to existing or new problems but also to test and implement a uh, developed solution in a co-creation manner and in a real life use context. So in this setting, users, private actors, but public actors as well, and knowledge institutes are usually working together, contributing to the innovation and development process taking place within a living lab. Uh, all participants, including the users, have decision power in the various stages of the innovation process. And so living labs have uh, lots of common elements, but multiple different implementations, as we will hear today from Eindhoven. 
As you might already know, Eindhoven is the fifth largest city in the Netherlands, in the south of the country, at the heart of the Brainport region. And the Brainport region is also among the most innovative regions worldwide. The city has been the hometown of Philips, the electronics company, since 1892. Uh, the founding of the company was actually the main factor that developed the city since it attracted many investors to the area, uh, especially high-tech companies. This made Eindhoven a major technological and industrial hub. But in 2000, Philips closed down and the city went through a period of depressions. Uh, lots of jobs were lost and the economic model of the entire city had to go through a radical shift. So, but today, the city of Eindhoven is one of the leading areas in the Netherlands in exploring the potential of living labs as innovative governance models. So in the city, several living labs uh, research projects, societal experiments are conducted in the public sphere, which makes Eindhoven also a heart of innovation in the field of smart cities. So before we start discussing three very concrete examples of different living labs that have been set up in Eindhoven, I will let our colleagues from Eindhoven give you some words of introduction about their city's history. But first, uh, we will show you a short movie about what is Eindhoven, because pictures are worth a thousand words. So here we go, this is Eindhoven. Okay, now I will give the floor to Marianne Willemsen, who will give you a few more words of introduction about Eindhoven. Marianne, I'll make you a presenter now so we can share your screen. Oops, YouTube. Nope. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Here we are. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Cecile, for uh, your introduction on, uh, on Eindhoven. It's a pity the, 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 the small movie didn't have uh, any sound on it. Oh, but, really? Uh, Oops. A... Oh, really? Yeah, really. Well, no worries. But uh, uh, welcome, everybody, on this, uh, to this webinar on uh, Living Labs in Eindhoven. As mentioned, my name is uh, Marianne Willemsen, uh, and I'm a project manager for uh, the municipality. And uh, uh, currently I work on the NRA area and also uh, on uh, the ROC uh, project. So I'm uh, very happy to uh, introduce you to our uh, city. Uh, some background, uh, Cecile already mentioned it, uh, Eindhoven is the, the fifth largest city in the Netherlands. And uh, it's located in the southern part of uh, the, the country, so we have uh, good connections to the Belgium and uh, and Germany as well, um, and we are uh, the center of uh, the Brainport uh, region in uh, in the Netherlands. Um, Eindhoven is an uh, is an old city. Um, it has uh, its city rights uh, since 1232, um, but it uh, was always an agricultural non-urban village. Um, and in the present city, when you walk around, uh, you will not see uh, many old buildings because uh, we had a uh, bombing of uh, the center in the Second World War and also the uh, drastic uh, city renewal in the 60s and 70s uh, demolished a lot of buildings. Um, Eindhoven is the, um, 
Eindhoven's Boom was made possible by, by, by Philips. And it is a classical company town. Uh, once you work for Philips, uh, Philips arrange your life like uh, um, shopping, schooling, uh, housing, but uh, yeah, even soccer they arranged. So in the in the 90s, when uh, Philips uh, uh, outsourced a lot of jobs uh, towards uh, low-cost uh, countries, um, the, the, the town was a bit in despair. And uh, also in that same period, uh, Dove Trucks uh, went uh, bank, uh, bankrupt. So many of the people are uh, were unemployed. And it's... Um, we we searched for a solution on that uh, problem, and we thought that collaboration was the the main point that we could uh, work on. So we invented a, a collaboration between the governments, the the, the the local companies, and knowledge institutes, and it's called uh, the, the triple helix. Um, and it, it was basically the the, the 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 funding of the brain ports uh, in in Eindhoven. Um, but we also noticed that as a city we were vulnerable when you're only uh, uh, focused on technology. So we broaden our scope to also design and knowledge. And we call it uh, TDK, uh, Technology, Design and Knowledge. And it's uh, one of our leading topics in, in, in the city. Um, Additionally, we, we thought the, the uh, broadened the triple helix to the quadruple helix by uh, uh, also involving uh, grassroots initiatives, uh, citizens, uh, end users, uh, artists, local entrepreneurs to our uh, collaboration. And uh, we, uh, we work on, on that in the city since uh, yeah, 2000. Um, it uh, was a, a good approach for Eindhoven because uh, it led to one of uh, it led to that Eindhoven was becoming one of the smartest regions in uh, in the world, with a high rate of uh, patents in uh, in Europe and uh, also after Amsterdam one of the highest rates uh, of foreign investments in the Netherlands. Um, Also, in the 90s, uh, awareness uh, us that uh, preserving and creating uh, the tangible and intangible heritage, our industrial heritage, uh, it, it changed in our opinion. Um, the old industrial complex were reused and turned into a, a potential for the city uh, for development and support uh, and also in temporary use for uh, knowledge and creative uh, industries. So in, 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 instead of a weakness, it becomes a strength for, uh, for our city. And from uh, a TDK uh, point of view, uh, and considering uh, the approach of the quadruple helix, we started to use our city as a, a living lab to try out several uh, opportunities for technical renewal, new governance approaches, uh, smart, smart light grids, uh, sustainable mobility, uh, and also uh, one of our latest uh, 3D printed houses. Um, using the creative uh, uh, and knowledge potential of our uh, local companies and our citizens and industries and uh, university, uh, we, we, we uh, started this, uh, this living lab approach. In this webinar, uh, we will not talk about all those uh, Living Labs are shown here. We focus on uh, three of uh, the Living Labs, and that's the uh, NRA area, uh, Strijp S and Stratums Eind. Uh, in NRA area, we uh, have policy innovations for adapt adaptive reuse and grassroots uh, initiatives. On Strijp S, it's uh, basically the renewal of the, the uh, Philips buildings uh, uh, combined with new uh, housing uh, and technical uh, renewal and smart mobility. And on Stratum's end, it's uh, uh, more crowd management systems uh, and data uh, uh, collecting and how to uh, uh, 
solve with that. So this is my brief uh, introduction uh, on Eindhoven. Now I'll try to switch to another presentation on, <laughs> uh, on the NRA area. Yes, we will start with the first example from uh, Living Labs in Eindhoven, which is, uh, as uh, Marianne said, the NRA area, so the former gas supply factories of Eindhoven. Um, so Marianne, I will let you explain uh, how the municipality turned this area into a Living Lab for cooperative development. Oh, we're at the end of the presentation, so I start at the beginning. <laughs> Spoilers! Sorry. Um, Sorry? No, no. So, um, uh, a, a, a short introduction on the on the history of uh, NRA. It's uh, an, an an area very uh, situated very close to the the center of uh, the the city, and next to residential areas, uh, very expensive residential areas. But it, it used to be the place of uh, the gas factory uh, uh, of Eindhoven. And uh, the buildings that remain are uh, historical and cultural uh, valuable. So, uh, but they were in a very uh, poor state. And because of the, the former user uh, and, uh, and his uh, unique histori historical approach, the, the buildings were, uh, are uh, of cultural uh, heritage for the city. And because of this function as a gas uh, factory, the soil was uh, heavily polluted and the municipality is uh, the owner of the grounds and the, and the buildings. So we were uh, responsible for cleaning the soil and that is a very uh, expensive assignment. So therefore, it was the intention in 2004 to demolish these uh, old buildings and uh, to build 350 new houses instead of them. But with the outbreak of the financial crisis, the, the project was put on hold. Um, however, as the, the former uh, user, uh, an energy company called Endinet, they moved away uh, and the buildings became vacant. And so they deteriorated uh, from not being used. And after all, it was decided to sell them. And our former elder man uh, uh, named the NRA area a living lab for cooperative uh, development and reducing regulation by the municipality. We were commissioned to manage the development of the area in an uh, organic way with as little legislation as possible in cooperation with the end users. And uh, by end users, we mean uh, future residents, uh, young entrepreneurs uh, and new startups. And just starting with uh, a, a blank paper is a very innovative uh, approach for, uh, for, our, for the municipality and also with uh, the end users. So um, <clears throat> the, the process was uh, coordinated by the university and um, um, we, we started uh, this development in 2013. So it took us a, lo a really long time to... Uh, um, everybody in the city was uh, given the possibility to, uh, um, to bid, bid on the buildings and on the lots of uh, NRA area. And the outcome is that we have uh, 15 uh, plans uh, all to, to renew the, the old buildings and also uh, some lots that are built with uh, new housing. Uh, the surrounding uh, neighborhood is also involved in the planning process from the beginning, the start of the process. <clears throat> Sorry. However, uh, due to uncertainties, because we want to let loose of reg uh, uh, legislation, of uh, regulation, sorry, um, uh, a limited uh, number of people objected to the, 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 to the plans. So that's why it took us so long to develop this, uh, this plan. But the majority of the neighborhood is very satisfied with the development of the area and the way we are dealing with it. Um, we asked the, the, the 
people who bid on the, the areas, what is your dream? And uh, we didn't want to have uh, real estate uh, uh, managers to develop uh, this, uh, this area. Um, also, because the buildings were already there, uh, we uh, started to uh, rent it out the buildings in the temporary use to artists and, and craftsmen uh, that uh, uh, had a cheap place to, to work and uh, the area of uh, benefits from their appearance uh, with the place making and the name making they did. Because uh, thanks to the temporary use, the area had developed a friendly reputation because it used to be an area that was closed with a fence. And in 2014, uh, the area opened at the big events in the city, like uh, Dutch Design Week and, and Glow, with, uh, with pop-up restaurants. And uh, so the larger uh, urban audience got the opportunity to discover, to discover the area. And um, yeah, the, the short-term results were the temporary use, uh, is that the buildings were opened and known to the, to the city and give the residents the, the possibility to the, discover the area. And the long term of uh, impact of uh, temporary use is that uh, a unique multifunctional district is added to, uh, to the center. Um, one of the grassroots initiatives uh, was a temporary greening of, uh, of the area, the site, in combination with a circular house. Um, this wooden house was built on, uh, on the NRA area and uh, we also make uh, plant boxes with, with trees and uh, flowers in it <coughs> and it was a real size uh, scale for the future interpretation of the, of the area. And the initiatives of uh, the, the area and, uh, and we from the municipality, we, we work together in our own time to, to plant this uh, uh, Plant boxes. And, um, um, I, I, I don't have enough time to show you all the initiatives that are uh, built now on the NRA area, but here are some uh, examples. And you see uh, 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 to the left side or below, it's uh, a complex for elderly people. Uh, and they want to, to look after the, uh, each other, and they call themselves advanced, uh, advanced living concept. Uh, to the bottom on the right hand, it's a future bed and breakfast uh, combined with a cooking studio and a housing uh, for a family. And um, um, also we have uh, yeah, the small one on the left hand top, it's uh, called the clubhouse uh, for the area, but it has to be uh, developed and renewed because it's a very poor state. Um, we are uh, often you see uh, that uh, temporary users uh, have to leave the area when the redevelopment starts. So we are very proud that uh, a group of uh, early adapters uh, young designers can stay in uh, this area. They found uh, they started in temporary use, and they now found a, a financier to back uh, them up in order to purchase uh, this building. And they will start uh, here uh, the renewal of the building after the summer period. And they are very connected to the the area and um, bring new ideas to uh, the development uh, process. So. To, to, to end this presentation, I have a few recommendations uh, for development with uh, end users. Uh, yeah. Open up, uh, give temporary uh, use uh, uh, buildings to uh, arts, uh, artists and craftsmen. Um, listen to the end users, uh, to their dreams and give them space to uh, develop them. Um, the municipality organization must facilitate this, uh, this uh, end users because they are not uh, used to uh, carrying out uh, redevelopment uh, activities. And uh, a process uh, supervisor uh, 
is uh, very useful for this end users, can be someone from university or from a municipality. And it's also very important that the municipality makes it clear in advance that uh, what the possibilities are for development to manage uh, the expectations. It's, uh, such a development takes a lot of time and patience and a lot of effort for, from everybody. And um, yeah, keep up the good work, uh, preferably in the, in the same team. And last but not least, um, this, uh, the, the, the cultural heritage uh, uh, buildings were declared a, a local monument in, uh, in September last year. Um, so thanks to the end users and all their efforts and the long term value of this building will be uh, guaranteed. So please come and visit uh, this area when you uh, come to Eindhoven. You're very <laughs> welcome. We will. Should open in September, right? Um, yes, uh, there are also already people living there, and uh, I think in September, October, the, the, there will be a, a kind of an opening. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you, Marianne. Uh, I should uh, mm -hmm. add also that uh, you will be able to find more information about the NRA area in the Rock case studies booklet that we will release soon. Uh, the booklet will be available to download and read online on the Rock website, so you will be able to find it by visiting the news section of our Rock website, which is uh, rockproject.eu. Uh, I also wanted to remind you that you can ask questions in the in the panel uh, in the question panel if you have already, and we will take them uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, so now we move on to the second example of uh, Living Labs in Eindhoven, and the second example is Stripe S, uh, where the Philips company was located. So before its regeneration, the area of Stripe was also known as the Forbidden City because of all the fences that were surrounding it. So nobody was going there and it was a huge abandoned area of 270,000 square meters. So it needed a large scale planning and regeneration strategy. And the city of Eindhoven worked on a strategic plan to revitalize the area in a modern, functional way. And today, Stripe S is a creative and cultural area of Eindhoven, basically a new neighborhood for the city, focused on living labs where creative persons, businesses and education work together on innovative products and projects. Uh, the director of the Stripe S site, Alwin Berning, will explain you what is happening there now and also in the future. So Alwin, I will make you a presenter now so you can take us to Stripe S. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I will tell you more about uh, the urban development of Sky Pass. Uh, you already mentioned my name, Owen Berning. Director of the public private partnership between the municipality of Eindhoven and Volker Wessels. And Volker Wessels is one of the biggest construction groups in the Netherlands. And we started this de development in 2001, 2002, and that was, uh, Mariam already mentioned, uh, the time that Philips was uh, almost bankrupt. So they uh, solved their uh, old uh, brownfields, their old factories, and that's when uh, the redevelopment started. And um, there was a lot of uh, national heritage. Uh, it's about uh, 67 acres or 27 hectare, uh, already mentioned. And it's about a lot of money. There's a lot of money invested in this location. And um, in total, uh, it's about 1.2 billion euros of uh, investment. Uh, already, we have a lot of visitors. That's the thanks of the clock building, where a lot of events take place from music. Uh, um, musical events um, but also business to business events um, and there's a lot of events uh, the Dutch design week uh, the heart of the Dutch design week is on Stripe S but also smaller events um, uh, like uh, a feel good market every uh, third Sunday of the month so there's a lot of events going on already there are more than a thousand companies on Stripe S a lot of startups a lot of scale ups uh, but also a big corporates like the Bosch and Philips is still uh, around on this, uh, this side. We are building uh, more than 4,000 houses. Already there are about uh, 1,200 houses 
and we are uh, just as we <laughs> sitting here uh, building about uh, 2,000 houses uh, this moment and there's a lot of uh, leisure uh, activities. But we came from a long way. This is a famous picture from uh, Vincent van Gogh. He also lived in this area and he made this picture in 1885. It's about uh, 144 years ago. And you see two uh, things on this painting. Uh, the first thing is uh, we are very poor. We are all farmers. And the one the thing we can grow on our <laughs> soil uh, were potatoes. So this picture is called the potato eaters. Um, and the second thing is very interesting, there was no electricity at that time. So this is not very long ago, 144 years ago. Uh, so this was uh, the, the industrial revolution already started, but on this region everybody was uh, really, really poor. But thanks of the bulb, uh, this region uh, uh, and the city uh, was part of this industrial revolution. So the beginning was making glass. And this was really uh, the first design you can say in, in this region. Uh, and um, the, the reason of the first world war uh, was that uh, because Phillips imported a lot of glass from Germany, Austria, uh, that sort of countries. But because of the first world war, they had to blow it uh, by itself and they had to know how to do that. So the first designer or the first expert was a German guy called Herr Müller from Germany and he brought us the knowledge about uh, blowing glass. And that was also the beginning of Stripe S. And um, this is the Stripe S area. Um, uh, you can see on this building that was our <coughs> first uh, glass factory. Um, and Stripe has uh, really uh, grow from that uh, knowledge of glass because we call it the vertical integration from sand, uh, the, the basics of glass to the customer, but also the beginning of the horizontal uh, integration because of the knowledge of making bulbs. They made uh, X-ray tubes, radio tubes, later on television tubes. So a lot of inventions take place because of the knowledge about how to make glass. So that was the start of uh, Stripe S. And nowadays we are part in what we call the Braidport Campus Community. Uh, and it's all about turning bright ideas uh, into value for society. And it's all uh, start with, the, on the left side, you see the TRLs, and that's uh, technology readiness levels. And it says something about how far <coughs> is the technology for uh, market ready. So it all started on the, uh, the university campus. It's all about science and education. The most smart square uh, kilometer uh, we have in this region is the high tech campus. It's all about the application, how to use uh, the technology. We have a lot of test sites in this region, and one of the most uh, beautiful is the automotive campus, uh, where there's a lot of about testing and piloting the technology. And that's where we are, Stripe S. Uh, we are the innovation district where creativity of creativity and design means technology. So it's all considered for me as a human being. And the good news for this region is that the making of all the high-tech uh, uh, equipment, machines, uh, etc., is coming back to this region. So we are also building a big Brainport industry campus uh, for the assembly, the production, and the deployment for, for the high-tech systems. And the good news is it's all close by and connected. You can, use, uh, you can reach all the campus uh, by, uh, by bicycle. But I know it's in car city, so we do it by, by, by car. Um, more about our vision about Stripe S is, um, uh, as Charles Darwin said, it's not being the biggest or the most intelligent or the strongest. No, we believe it's about responsive to change. So uh, we are want to be the most adaptive. And that's our vision, embrace the change. And we have three themes uh, on this urban development. And the one, the first is, uh, we call it the small village concept, or better, maybe it's the super village concept, where we make the urban space and the ground floors all uh, access for public functions. So the, the retail, the leisure, uh, the shops, uh, the museum, the cinema, it's all on the, on the ground floors. And we believe that the urban space, the public space, um, uh, works together with the ground floor. So you see no cars on the... Uh, on the public space because they are in the in the parking pockets on the on the sides of this area 
and we believe that you need a walkable or in the, in the Netherlands a bikeable city. So we see a lot of space for bikes, uh, but also for the pedestrians and for the people. And on the first and uh, the next floors, it's all about working, living, uh, and we like uh, to mix them on an object level, but also on an area level. So we, we, we believe that you working, living, leisure, uh, education, all the functions. So the, the mix of the program, the mixed use, uh, is really important in this, in this concept. And another um, important thing is that you uh, that we have a metaphor as the escalator. We believe that also for the living programs or for the working programs, uh, we have a lot of space for starters, but also for the growing of the starters, also for the scale ups, but also in the living program, the people who left the schools, we want them to keep them in this uh, in the city. So we really want to make place for the youngsters and make it possible that they can grow and can make an, uh, make a career. So that's uh, important in this uh, in this theme. And also it's about old buildings and new ideas, but also about a lot of new buildings. So i uh, give you some examples of uh, the new buildings uh, we are making here. So you see that it's uh, high dense because we really want to make a second city center uh, in this formerly forbidden city, as mentioned. Um, some examples for our new buildings. Here the old buildings. This is a build, uh, building uh, we will uh, make up both uh, our urban sports uh, center. So we have one of the biggest uh, urban sports centers of the Netherlands. We keep them uh, here because they are very important for, uh, for the vibrant uh, atmosphere you uh, can uh, um, um, have on the also, we make a vertical uh, wood, one of our towers. The second theme, yeah, this is the topic of today, is uh, we have, uh, from the beginning, um, uh, make the position of Stripe Best as a living lab. And we make it also active. So we, uh, everybody, we say uh, living uh, the lab, uh, not the living lab, but living the lab. So it's really about everything. Uh, one of the things we have uh, discovered is that you need um, uh, an infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure not only the roads and the trees, but also an infrastructure for new ICT uh, solutions. So we have made an infrastructure of uh, optical fiber, uh, so you can uh, use your uh, lighting grid in this example uh, for um, the transport of data, but also for all types of sensor network. So it starts with the infrastructure level, uh, so we made uh, uh, Two backbones of the optical fiber. Uh, we also uh, create our own uh, smart city hub, uh, our own cloud on Stripe S. So we are not uh, collecting data, but when we need the data, it's our own data of the data for our own uh, communities. But it's all about livable layer, it's all about uh, new services for the people who live, work, or visit uh, Stripe S. And so uh, security, uh, but also comfort, fun, uh, a lot of uh, new services uh, we are trying uh, to uh, to develop on this uh, on the site. And we develop it, and it's the lot thing together with our ecosystem, with our communities. So it started all with the quality of life. It has to make a solution for a better or a healthier or a more secure uh, ways of life. We do it together with our communities. And we, our goal is to inspire and to stimulate uh, um, uh, all the people who live, work, and, and create new ideas on the Slide Pass. So that's what we are doing here. And um, you are very welcome to visit Slide Pass when you are in this uh, neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Alwin. And I believe you also are developing uh, other areas of the former Stripe zone. So the Stripe uh, T, I think. Uh, Oh. It's also under redevelopment. The whole area is, is still under development as well, so it's going to grow in the future. So uh, yeah. now we have heard about two examples. There's one uh, last example of living labs from Eindhoven, which is called Stratum Zind, uh, also very different from the two previous examples. So Stratum Zind is the longest pub street in the Netherlands with all the consequences you can imagine when you are the longest pub street in the Netherlands. Uh, 
the police department of Eindhoven reports uh, about 800 incidents per year on the streets. And in an attempt to reduce these numbers, a research consortium, including the University of Technology Eindhoven, several enterprises and the municipality, they turned the area into a living lab. The researchers, they studied the impact of light and also smell on human behavior, and they, they use this knowledge to reduce the number of uh, aggression. So the idea is to de-escalate potential violent conflicts by using light and smell uh, scenarios. But uh, Tinus Kanters, who is with us today and who is in charge of these living labs in the municipality of Eindhoven, will tell us more now about how this works concretely and what are also the consequences on the data, uh, citizens' data and uh, privacy. So, Tinus, I will make you now a presenter so we can see your screen and you can explain about Stratum site. Unmute. Okay. Yes, perfect. Check. Do we have the presentation on screen? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, it works. This is I work for the local government, but also for DITS, which is the Dutch Institute for Technology, Safety and Security. And we try to develop apps to have a, a, a safer uh, environment. Um, this is a little example of Eindhoven. We, are, we have more patents for instance, than Silicon Valley, if you compare it to 10,000 inhabitants. So, as Mariana told, and uh, Owen also, we are uh, an upcoming uh, region. This is how it looks, uh, working together in Brainport. Uh, you see the automotive uh, campus has a big one inside, uh, uh, down on the ditch, but also biotech systems, Brainport industries, etc. All the blue dots are uh, either a company or a local government or an, an institute, the technological institute or a university. <clears throat> That's working together in this area, like in the quadruple helix. This is what our city uh, uh, proved to be a, a smart city. Uh, if you look at the words over there, there's no, not one word of uh, technology in it because we think that technology is only an enabler for a smart city. So you're not building a smart city with uh, hanging out a lot of sensors. And, uh, but a smart city is a city that listens to his uh, uh, inhabitants and look, looks at strong social networks and social wealth compared with caring for environment, good economic climate, etc. Uh, as Mariana told, we started out a, a new kind of tender, tendering for light, public lighting, so four years ago. Uh, not asking companies to uh, to give us an offer for lantern poles, uh, bulbs, electricity, and as lay, but giving us a, a, a view to the future of light as a service, not uh, buying bulbs, etc., but light as a service. Uh, <clears throat> then we had a, a four-year uh, period of uh, negotiation and asking to uh, the market uh, for the possibilities. Then we agreed on a consortium with uh, with Philips and uh, Heimans, and then within some months, the technical agreement was made. And then it took another eight months uh, discussing uh, data ownership uh, privacy issues. Because when we started out this project uh, for the Smart Light and uh, some four years ago, nobody within uh, the local government of the city of Eindhoven or national government or European government had made uh, a point about data ownership and about censoring in public space, etc. So we developed, I will show you later on, we developed our own uh, let's say, local law about data ownership and IoT charter. I'll come to that one later on. 
This is the Stratum Center, quick view, 50 pubs. It's, it's really in the center of the city of Eindhoven. And there was an economic going down on, on the street and aggression coming up. So we had to know for sure that we could change that. This is uh, the Stratum Center uh, uh, on the busy day. You will see uh, a lot of people. This is uh, King's Day in the city of Eindhoven. And this photo was taken from out of my uh, uh, office, which uh, used to be on the Stadium Center until two weeks ago. <laughs> then we moved to a bigger uh, place. The Living Lab, as we call it, it's an instrument to influence, to measure the influence on the behavior with light and fragrance, uh, design, nudging, uh, and all kind of other uh, influencing behavior. We are a test facility for new sensors, for data harvesting, for ethics, and for system architecture. We started out for the, the Star Zend 2.0 only, but now we are developing to uh, City Lab Eindhoven, which will be more broader than the Star Zend. We will take the whole in the city of Eindhoven to, to roll out what we discovered at the Star Zend project. This is me on the Salem end. You will see all the screens where I have the information coming in from the sensors. Most of it is uh, real time. We, I don't sit there on Saturday evening to wait for a fight or something. System works uh, automatically, so we uh, store all the, the data. We use privacy by design. That's, uh, we ask the people developing uh, the software to in, in the start already think about anonymizing uh, all data information so we don't have an issue with uh, with privacy uh, this is what we already uh, uh, gather if you look at uh, temperature uh, if it's raining yes or no because if it's raining and the temperature is down most people are in the pubs and not uh, out on the street um, sound uh, the amount of sound, but also we can measure uh, stress into sound if people are angry, yes or no. Uh, the amount of people walking in an area by uh, using counting cameras, which will analyze if it's a person going through the, the view of the camera or uh, another thing. We will have uh, the uh, where people are coming from, that's done by uh, the, the telecom companies. We just buy the, the marketing figures of the, of the telecom companies, and then we can tell, well, so many percent of the people are coming from, let's say, Amsterdam or Belfast or whatever, on the Stadium Zend. The way the light is uh, set up, uh, the police figures, uh, social sensors, brewery, uh, the, the amount of beer brought to the Stadium Zend by the breweries, the amount of waste collected on Monday, other open data sets like uh, bicycle uh, uh, counters, uh, car parking information, etc. Uh, one of the projects uh, where we started with was called Deescalate, diffusing escalating behavior through the use of interactive light scenarios. Uh, set up by the Technical uh, University and Philips uh, with it and BITS and uh, all the, the pub owners uh, at the Stadium Zend. Uh, they were collected within Polyground. And <clears throat> this is uh, the, what we can do with the lighting. We don't make a disco out of it, but we, we can make any color, any light movement, uh, uh, Brighter light, uh, uh, softer light, etc., on the street. And there was a study done by the Technical University uh, to look at what kind of light compares the best to what kind of temperature, what kind of uh, day in the week, what kind of uh, season, and what kind of uh, activities. For instance, if we have a, a soccer evening with uh, the local uh, soccer club PSV, and well, they won't get championship uh, this year, but actually, I'm sure. Then we make the light go uh, red and white, and if it's a carnival, we have orange and blue light, and 
we, and we have the, the opening of the new uh, LHBT uh, uh, pub. We will make any color uh, of the rainbow before that pub, etc. So we can interchange with the atmosphere over there. To show you a little example, influence of color, this is a black and white picture of a girl with a red surrounding. And then we, uh, we compared it to a black and white picture of the same girl, but with a white surrounding, asking people which of the two girls is the most interesting girl, you think? Well, the message didn't change, but uh, if, if there's a red surrounding, then it was twice as much attractive than uh, with a white surrounding. We did the same thing with a boy with a red shirt on or a blue shirt on, asking about uh, trustability, uh, sensuality, etc. And then you can see that twice as many people thought with a red shirt on, the guy was uh, more trustworthy and more sexy. So think about that when you go to your closet. Uh, this is how it looks on the stands, and this is uh, the light box and, and some, some, some sound sensors. And then we can see the sound on an event. I don't have to go over there with the, with the sensor. I just can look it up at my laptop. But we also give this to the people living next to the festival and to the festival organizer. So they can see for themselves how the sound is going. And if they uh, uh, go over the, the permit, then they will have an automatic SMS on the telephone that your sound is too loud. But also then the, the people living in the neighborhood can take the telephone and say, hey, now he's too loud, let's go back. Uh, so we can see uh, cleanups cars coming in, the, the event when it starts, and most important when, when the end of the event is there. So we don't have to go there, we can um, uh, do it on a distance. This is uh, one of the five poles standing around the Stalem Zand. On the bottom, a police camera, and above that, a county camera, and some MAC address readers and connection uh, stuff and microphones. This is the newest uh, one developed by a, a, a private company, placed in public space, uh, which isn't only an advertisement pole, but also has a lot of sensors uh, in it on top where we can see people walking, can uh, look at the sound, can measure the air quality, etc. So that was that was the moment that we needed uh, some kind of uh, law about data collecting and data ownership. This is another example on uh, uh, looking at movements of people um, and counting uh, per square meter, so for crowd management. And we can see this is uh, at the Glow Festival. And then we can see uh, how fast it increases the, the number of people per square meter to have um, um, uh, to take measurements if it's getting overcrowded. This is uh, <coughs> done with a microphone of one of the companies developed here on, stri on the Stripe S area, as Alwin said, uh, who can detect aggression within a voice. Uh, you will see a, a fight uh, on left uh, under. It was detected by the system automatically. At that time, we didn't have a direct co uh, connection to the police yet. So a bystander had to warn the police. And uh, the next slide, which is 25 seconds later, you can see that the police is arriving to the uh, fight. But they were standing just around the corner. So if they had a warning earlier, then we could have uh, minimized the fight to only three seconds instead of 25 seconds. And that hurts, that hurts a lot, 22 seconds of uh, punching. Uh, we can also get uh, business intelligence out of the, the system counting people. You will know how many people visited uh, your festival in the first half hour or the first three hours or the total of events per day origin of people, where they are coming from on King's Day Festival. <coughs> uh, police numbers, fights. This is the system architecture. We, we uh, are very fond of, uh, of the, the uh, fire architecture developed by the European Union uh, as an answer to the Microsoft and, and uh, etc. 
This is a smart city platform as a data knowledge hub, uh, non-intrusive, open to third parties. You already arranged, uh, looking at this one, to your open data system for your local government. And uh, we as City of Eindhoven are also on the national scale working on the standardization of the uh, APIs, working in between the, the uh, city services, service orchestrator, contact adapters, etc. Um, and we have a working ver version of this one. And the Fiber uh, uh, Foundation is very fond of us because we made it work also. What we do with data is a, a modular data harvesting, not one big, uh, uh, not one company uh, having all the data, but all little data sets, modular. With the data library, uh, a national sensor list done by the cadaster. Uh, Tailor-made context broker, so you can connect any data set to your uh, context broker and get an answer on your dashboard and then give it out to actuators. This is uh, one of the two slides which are most important, I think. This is about the open data principles. The first uh, sentence is, data receding in public space belongs to everybody. And that's a big one because uh, uh, telecom companies are not used to that. They did it for 20 years themselves. Uh, but we wanted to make a statement that not everybody, not companies are not allowed to hang out sensors in public space without telling anything or sharing the, the data, etc. So we are uh, really discussing a lot with, uh, for instance, uh, Philips or Signify with the, with the new lighting about data ownership and about privacy issues on that one. Um, on national level, we have uh, a group together with the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the, the foundation of uh, national government, uh, local government, about uh, responsible data use. And we are just discussing with them and the national uh, privacy authorities about data ownership, about uh, public space, and about ethics. So this is an important one. And the other one is uh, the IoT Charter. You see seven points. Number one is a range, that's the GDPR. Uh, but we as a local government said, uh, when you want to do business with the city of Eindhoven, you all have to come up with open data, open interfaces, embrace open standards, share, support modularity, maintain security, and accept social responsibility. This is a sign we developed uh, for uh, letting people know that there uh, are sensors around. And we are actually discussing now with the Ministry of Internal Affairs to make this a national uh, one. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tinis. So, as you could hear from our different speakers, uh, Eindhoven, in Eindhoven, the Living Labs are really used as tools to um, experiment and, and work together and it has become now part of the sort of the DNA of the of the city uh, even though it's not really embedded in an official uh, strategy but uh, in more general terms I would like to give you some recommendation maybe coming from different examples and research on living labs on how to work with uh, these living labs and the most important things to keep in mind to make them work so according to research, uh, there are eight steps on, uh, to the Living Lab way of working and some recommendations have been uh, formulated for each. Uh, the first phase, it's uh, the initiation phase, which you can see on this slide here. In this phase, uh, we should define the goals, the problems, the target groups, and the ideas for a living lab. Uh, remember that in the introduction, I said that the final aim is to set up a project to solve a problem and then test it and apply it to real life conditions. So partners needs to be uh, result oriented to encourage motivation, ownership, and commitment to the project. In the second phase, which is plan development. So here we start on, the, on this uh, 
round circle. Uh, all partners, they need to contribute to the design of the process. So interests and solutions should be aligned between the partners. And in this phase, it is very important to have a clear leadership to organize people and resources in order to achieve the results. So for instance, it's important to set up uh, the, the role of process manager to kind of lead the team. Uh, communication and flexibility in this phase are also very important between the partners. Uh, when a shared vision has been formulated, it's time to move on to the co-creative design process, which is this part here. And in this phase, uh, the project is prototyped and tested. Uh, the co-creation session, so where the partner they meet, they discuss their ideas. This session should be regular, results-oriented again, and the setting is very important there, as well as the language. So we should avoid the jargon whenever we can and focus more on the doing. It's important also in this phase to be very honest about the difficulties faced between the, the partners and to recognize the challenges and the vulnerability. This way, it becomes easier to establish trust between, between the, the different partners in the living labs. And again, here, the role of a process manager is uh, quite valuable. Uh, as you know, in the living lab activities, the design activities are alternating with the implementation in the real life environment. So in this phase, which is uh, implementation phase, the end users should be involved. And we should also start thinking at this moment about the long term management structure and the business model if we want to sustain the innovation or the process that the living lab is developing. It's important as well to think about evaluation. I know it's a bit, uh, it's always a difficult uh, uh, topic, but uh, and it's often also minimized or disregarded, but the consequences later can, can be quite uh, huge. So therefore it's important to develop a monitoring process from the start. And uh, here we can also involve, uh, for instance, the knowledge institutes or the universities to help us uh, developing ed indicators, for instance. The evaluation phase usually is followed by the refinement of the innovations, so namely further improving or fine-tuning the, the product or the process to better fit the users or the stakeholders' needs. The dissemination that we see here in blue, it's not really a phase because uh, it should happen before, during and after the process. But it's important to think about it to also address the critics and the questions from the public. And finally, the last phase, which is not always the case, but uh, should uh, sometimes be, also is the replication phase. So this refers to the reproduction of the developed innovation in other relevant urban contexts. This replication should, of course, be adapted because the context and the lessons from the Living Lab implementation differ from one area to another. So this was, in a nutshell, the eight steps to the Living Lab way of working. Now I would like to take some questions for our speakers. So if you have any questions, you can use the GoToWebinar question box um, and we will, uh, we will take some questions. Uh, if there are no questions at the moment, I can also kickstart with a few that I have. So the first one maybe uh, I would like to know for the city of Eindhoven if uh, the city has uh, developed or set up a specific collaborative structure to meet and discuss with the different stakeholders involved in the various living labs. So I will maybe unmute Marianne in the, if you can answer this first question and while we are waiting for the, for the participants to ask their own questions. So I, re I repeat my, my question maybe. So has the municipality set up specific structure to discuss with the stakeholders involved in the different living labs you have in the, in the city? I know that in the NRA you had regular meetings with, uh, with your end users, but uh, at municipality level, is it something that you do with all the living labs happening in the city at the same time that are testing different models? Marianne, is, can you hear me? No, I cannot hear you, but you cannot hear Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, did you hear my question? Yeah? Uh, 
Okay. Should I repeat the question? Hello? We we have can, can did you hear my question or not? I hear your question. How can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yeah. No, as a municipality, we, we don't. Oh. Wait, there's some sound issues. Okay. It, it is uh, always uh, 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 tailor work. You have to work uh, for your project and your end users. So yeah. it's not um, uh, customized. You have to. It's not a blueprint. No, it isn't. Hmm. Is that uh, a question? Uh, an answer for you? Yeah, I think that's uh, that was more or less what I wanted to know. So there's no organic uh, it's more like an organic discussion with the different end users organic, or different stakeholders uh, depending on the uh, the project you're working on and yeah. it's it depends on the the the, the, the cooperation you mm. and how people uh, can work together and in what uh, frequency they can work together so mm. you have to, to find uh, out uh, in advance before starting the process how you will work together. And yeah. How you will do it. So that's probably part of this initiation phase I was explaining before. Uh, we have another, we have questions now from participants that are arriving. So the first question is from uh, Karina Venkamp. Uh, the question is which departments within the municipality were involved in the process of development of the Living Lab? So, Mariana, for you, I know you're part of the urban planning department, but uh, were mm -hmm. there other departments involved in the different living labs? Um, I guess it also depends on which project you're working on as well. I probably. think it's mainly the urban development department, but also the economic department is involved and the safety uh, uh, department and also the cultural de uh, department for the temporary use and the, the, the events and uh, mm. how to combine them on the, on, the, on the area. So it is a broad uh, uh, cooperation in, within the municipality. So it's a cross-cutting work as well. So you have to work with different departments. Yes, of course, always. Mm. Yeah, always, but it's not the case everywhere, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> Uh, okay, I guess that answers the question from Karina. There's another one from Martin Williamson, uh, I guess for more for Tinus because it's about Stratum Zeind. Uh, have there been any complaints from citizens visiting the pub street uh, on them being tracked or monitored? Um, so I guess, yeah, that's that's the that's the good question because um, you, Tinus said that you inform the citizen and you communicate with them with the with these signs that you put in uh, in the city. But maybe some citizens think that's not enough, and there there has been some complaints uh, about them being monitored and uh, their their data being used for um, for yeah the escalation of uh, event of violence. So. Has there been any complaints? Uh, no, until now there are no complaints. Um, because we are very open on it and we are also, as I told, uh, we try to develop all the software uh, with mm. privacy as design. So uh, all the software that we develop are, uh, in the end, it's uh, an anonymous uh, comparing of facts, which will point out a place that we can address on that place something is happening which is normal we don't know if it's a boy or a girl or the mm. age or the gender or we just know something is happening over there so it's more anonymous yeah but i have a i have a related question actually you know that there is the gdpr who entered into force uh last year has anything changed since the implementation of the gdpr at european level so the gdpr is the 
uh, general what is it? yeah the regulation for privacy yeah. uh, and data protection at eu level i don't know if that had any consequences at local level as well for you no because uh, uh, we also work together with the national privacy authorities and europe uh, in developing uh, the gdpr uh, and we are still in contact with the national uh, privacy authorities uh, concerning the the new technologies hmm. which has no answer yet from the gdpr so gdpr is very natural for us and very good to to have as as a guidance yeah we have other questions uh, lots of questions are coming that's good so from susan jameson from liverpool uh what period has the municipality been working on living lab concepts within eindhoven and secondly when and how did they initially start um so i guess that's more about when did you start working with living labs so that was quite a long time ago i guess Thank you. <laughs> um, we started in Stripe S. Yeah, uh, really, that was the first uh, when the when the was outside. So we started uh, in 2006, 2007, and in 2008 we really started the infinite design in the Blitz European project, and it was all about the future of uh, of light. And it was uh, mm. these days because of the LED light, the introducing of the digital lights. So uh, that we really, our, our big lab concept started, uh, yeah, I think, in 2005, 2006. And the first results were in 2008. Mm. There is another sub question in, in Suzanne's uh, question. Uh, she asked if uh, Open Eindhoven is linked to Open Amsterdam in some ways. Uh, I don't know if that's something also. Yeah, Do you know? know. No. Um, Amsterdam and uh, Eindhoven developed the data principles I showed. We developed them together. Mm. So we, we do as cities still have our own open data platform. There is no national open data platform. Uh, the open data of Amsterdam, open data of Eindhoven, it's all arranged in. Uh, nearly the same way so citizens can go into the data and get the data out for free mm. work with it. okay thank you um i have lots of other questions so first from kim from gothenburg uh how much participation from the citizens do you have and how how often do they participate? How much are they involved in the decision making? And then there's another question from Kim as well. What part fades first and how do you get back on the horse? <laughs> so yeah, more about the challenges and uh, how to get the citizens involved in the first place. How do you re reach out to them and convince them to stay? I know that for the NRA, nobody dropped out of the project for, for the three years it lasted. So it's quite impressive. But do you know how this happened? Because you listen to them, or because, yeah, is there a magic uh, trick? <laughs> the magic trick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, the there is. <laughs> but but one of the the, the the things we did, we uh, we talked a lot to all the end users, mm. and we um, uh, took them in the uh, every step in the process. So we uh, took them, uh, we helped them as much as possible, but that was... Uh, Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as uh, an attendee in listen-only mode. That was strange. Okay, sorry for this. <laughs> So Marianne, please continue. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Okay. Um, so did you hear, sir, or shall I repeat it? Maybe repeat because I think there was some background noise suddenly. So okay. about the magic trick we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was no trick I mentioned because uh, we, we we talked a lot to all the end users and it was a very time-consuming process. 
um, but um, I think you uh, should explain every step you have to make and why uh, some delays uh, appear and uh, how you uh, deal with them and uh, give them a, a perspective to the future how to uh, uh, develop it and uh, to go on. So that's one, and, and I think yeah. the, the other question the, is more in general. About, about the you, yeah, uh, about the failure and the uh, challenges. How do you how do you get back on the horse? That's what Kim wrote. Uh, Was there any failure? That uh, things that you would I never know, do again uh, the, the, the same horse. way? We didn't use a horse in uh, in Eindhoven. <laughs> <laughs> yes, on the car then maybe. <laughs> On the basic car, okay. Uh, we, we make baby steps, uh, small steps ahead, and um, I think that make people uh, uh, willing to cooperate for a long, long term. And um, yes, we are very proud that nobody dropped out of the, the process. Um, but um, it, it, it was uh, a lot of work. <laughs> So another question about the Stratum Zeint, uh, about the, were the pub owners also cooperative in your activities and how did you convince them to, to get on board? So that's more for Tinus. So about the, the pub owners in the street, were they also cooperating with you in the, in the living lab? <coughs> yes, uh, the, the start of the living lab on the Stratum Zeint was together with the pub owners and the groups of people living around the Stratum Zand. They, they joined up and they uh, asked for money at the regional uh, authorities and they got money to, to start up the event. So the group owners were one of the initiative uh, guys. Okay, and a related question from uh, Yanis. Uh, does the municipality provide any subsidies or financial assistance to the companies that are testing new smart city solutions? Uh, so, for instance, uh, programming soft for recognizing aggression. So, some of the programs that you are testing in the in the Stratum Zine Living Lab, do, do the municipality provide any subsidies or financial assistance? No, most of the time the municipality uh, 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 makes it able for that uh, companies to test out their systems. So they are allowed to come in and uh, to test out their systems, we don't pay for it. So it's more on the voluntary basis that yeah, they, they yeah. you provide a space for them to test their tool basically, so they should. Uh, yeah, yeah, they can, be and because we have, uh, uh, as a living lab, we are, uh, we are internationally very known so a lot of uh, other companies and uh, local governments and other countries come to visit the Stalin Zen. It's hmm. a showcase for them. We have a question here from uh, Martin to Alwin. Uh, how did you choose the mix of use for the ground floors in Stipes? So the different mix between the shops and the cinemas, etc. And uh, what kind of feedback did you get in regards to the specific uses? Maybe Alwin, you, you have some word for this? Yes. The question is how to mix? Uh, how did you choose the mix of use for the ground floors? Did you have a call or I don't know how, how practically did it work? Uh, how we choose? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, partners involved in development of Stripe S. So we have uh, uh, housing corporations, uh, we have uh, commercial parties. So uh, we are looking for a mix of more commercial functions um, at, at the one hand and on the other hand, more cultural functions. And mm. we are trying to seek a, a balance and, and yeah. to, uh, to create the right balance. Uh, we use our brand. Uh, we have the brand of Stripe S and we have uh, we load the brand uh, just like uh, all the big brands, uh, like uh, big sport brands or uh, or the cars, uh, we, we look like, uh, uh, we, we search for the right marketing tools, but it all starts and ends with the entrepreneurs. So we are really looking to our local heroes um, uh, to do, uh, uh, yeah, to, uh, 
to manage the shops or the museum or the craft. That's the most important eh? to find mm. the, the right local hero. Yeah. But from top down, we are really looking and um, fits it our brand, yes or no. And now everyone is yes, uh, we will facilitate, stimulate, uh, get the right functions on the on the ground floor. And that's also a lot of work. It's uh, really, uh, and a lot of people are involved. Hmm. We have a question from Central Europe, from Debrecen in Hungary. Uh, my question is focusing on the political issue. How the leaders of the city committee initiate a living labs? Uh, what is your message to city leaders in Central Europe? So how do you convince the city committee to, to initiate? Uh, a living lab, I guess that's the question. Do you uh, you want to ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> it's more a general question, I guess. So whoever has uh, an answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay uh, <clears throat> the the uh, living labs in, in the city of Eindhoven are not all initiated by by the local government. The Stalin Lab was initiated by uh, the pub owners, working together with some other people. Stipe S was uh, uh, started off uh, because we needed to do something with the uh, big space over there. And I think NRA was uh, started up by the local government, mm. which had uh, uh, in that time already some experience with the two other living labs, Stipe said. As and, uh, and Stam Zen. So, the best thing to do with the local government is show them that living labs work as a, as uh, a creative uh, working together with people. It's also about uh, when you want to be an innovative, innovative uh, and creative, uh, then you have to find new solutions. Mm. Um, something and never tried before uh, so you have to be brave that's very important um, and, and can you be brave and, and that's really um, yeah you, you are searching and um, when you are searching you make a lot of uh, mistakes so there is also be um, a, a ground for that that, that that you can make uh, mistakes and, and that's really about experiment that's uh, being uh, innovative and yeah that's that's in our dna as a region so it has also be a part of your yeah, cultural heritage it's <laughs> <So DNA. laughs> uh, there's two questions that are related now it's about how do we keep the citizens engaged for a long time so there's one question from kim and one from uh, joan um, so, is there any tools or processes that you would like to share on how you keep the citizen engaged? What are the incentives? Maybe for the NRA, that's the most relevant uh, example, probably. Uh, uh, and then, I think in general, we have a, we have a, a digit digi panel, digi panel. Uh, where we can ask our citizens uh, how they think about uh, governance or policy uh, making uh, in general. And, and that uh, is a kind of questionnaire that is sent out, uh, I think, four or five times a year, and it's uh, all over Eindhoven. Uh, we use that data from the digital panel and um, we uh, get back up to the, the politi politicians uh, about that. So that's more in general. Uh, for the NLA area, we, uh, um, we, we started with uh, connecting uh, in, in the process all the people who want to be involved. Just mm. not just the end users, but also the neighborhood, uh, uh, other stakeholders uh, like some other stichting and there's a local uh, party for uh, uh, heritage uh, development. So we had a, a large group of uh, stakeholders we started and um, to, yeah, to keep them informed and to take them in the process I think that's the most important uh, part of the, of the NRA development. So that's more uh, in, to the uh, NRA project. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. I guess that answers also the question of uh, Michael from Michael who asked uh, uh, where more people involved at the end users and the neighbors. So, for instance, ex interested citizens, as you said, so different people from different uh, interests or backgrounds, they were also involved in the in the development process of the NRA. Uh, and I guess the incentive was also that in the end they they are able to settle in and to 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 live and and work there. That's also uh, to to design the the neighborhood that they want, basically. What you said with uh, when they shared their dream. So in the end, you try to make the dream come true. So that's one good ex incentive to stay uh, engaged. Yeah, and also a lot of, of a lot of ownership from the end users. The people mm -hmm. are, are really uh, connected to that uh, area. I think uh, people when when you fall in love with the building. Uh, <laughs> You do a lot of uh, effort to uh, make it beautiful and uh, sustainable for a long time and term. People want to live their lives in that area. It's not for short term uh, short term uh, investments. They they really have a commitment for for. Uh, lifetime that's very long but, but it, it, it's uh, more than just a uh, period and i think ownership alwin also mentioned it uh, ownership is one of the uh, most important uh, issues on that hmm. there's another question from pamela from bologna uh, how did you provide feedback to the participants on the status of implementation of the initiative? So is there any specific tools that you used to provide the feedback? Um, the main tool we used was uh, email. <laughs> we uh, <laughs> uh, informed a lot of people by email. Uh, that mm. they are, uh, um, there were meetings, uh, there were uh, uh, there were selectors or not, uh, the, the, the progress of, uh, of the, the developments, uh, when there were meditations. So we had a lot of uh, correspondence with on, on email. Yeah, that's sometimes basic tools, but efficient to reach out. And I guess meetings and uh, also on-site uh, on-site meetings when they could go on-site. Uh, there's also questions about the data models and softwares in the Stratum Zijn. So two practical questions. How is the platform sustained uh, from Suzanne from Liverpool? And also are the data models and software open source from Kim in Gothenburg? So more for Tinus, this question. Yes. Can they be reused by other cities, these uh, data models and software that you are developing? Yeah, I, am I on the mic? Because I see it's muted. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the data model is, uh, is on the internet. Uh, Smart City Start. It's called, if you Google it. There you can download it, uh, but also the fireware, the concept of fireware is uh, developed by the European Commission. It's uh, mm -hmm. free and open software. It comes with a big library of software. Sometimes you have to buy software uh, licensed, and, but there's also open software with it. And the, the, the Smart City Starters Kit is uh, a, a building, uh, how do you say, it, manual which part you have to put in first and then the second and then the third that you will have it working if you have if you are a little bit of programmer within half a day you can build your own platform if you have apis to your sensors then you can just uh, drag them in hmm. and make everything together so it's yes it's reusable it's free it's open software uh, you can find it on the internet um and in 
to some is, week times we will come out with the next uh, generation smart city starts kit uh -huh. and uh, is this in your in your presentation the link to the to the uh, software it's no, not, it's not in there. You have to Google it, Smart City Starts Kit, or I have to send ah, it to you. Yeah. One of these. So maybe I will, we will uh, send the presentations to the participants, or the yeah. attendees. So if you can send us the link as well, so we can put it in the email. So everybody has the, the tools. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we're going to take one last question, and it's a funny one for everyone. Uh, from Yanis, uh, what is the worst that happened while testing a new solution in the living lab? So to <laughs> to end this question uh, moment with a, a terrible moment, something that happened <laughs> during testing uh, the testing phase of the living lab, do you have a, let's say, bad memory, one bad memory, and maybe a good memory as well to, to balance it a bit? So for for each of you maybe in in your different living labs, Yanis asked, "What is the worst that happened?" Okay, thank you. If something um, happened, Yanis maybe everything was good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, the best thing to end this uh, living lab, but uh, I'll give it a try. Um, I think uh, the worst thing that uh, uh, could happen is that when you're uh, the people you work for. They they uh, they they are demotivated uh, mm. and not want to go on um, because then you're uh, in, on your own in a traditional uh, approach like the municipality uh, takes the lead um, and uh, on several uh, uh, times we 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 had to talk a lot. To, to keep uh, people uh, on board, and um, it's, 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 these are those moments that uh, when you're a project manager, you uh, um, uh, it, it takes a lot of effort for, for, for to go on. Mm. And uh, we're very proud we we succeed. succeed. And now people are living on the NRA area, so that's our main uh, uh, achievement in this. Any memories from others? Or um, we can also close this session if you have no other uh, answers. No, I, I agree with, uh, with Marianne. Time is our mm. biggest enemy. Uh, the early mm. development uh, is about more than 40, 50 years of time. And um, there's no uh, patience <laughs> with those guys. We are very busy uh, and we want to make uh, progress. Uh, and sometimes you need more time. Mm. So time is really one of uh, the most important things to, to manage. And there's the most uh, negative uh, experience you can say. So not enough time or too much time as well, because if the living labs yeah, the go on, takes a lot of yeah. time and you have yeah. never enough time. Never enough time. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. There was a lot of questions. I'm I'm very glad that uh, people were really interested in in all this in in all the examples from from Eindhoven. So thank you very much for having attended this uh, rock webinar it was quite a success we were hosted uh, the webinar was hosted by Eurocities and Julie's bicycle as I said and we have a full program of webinar that we you can find on the rock website and the next one is planned on the 23rd of May so in uh, one week uh, and this time we will focus on improving improving biodiversity uh, opportunities for cultural heritage venues and sites this one will be hosted by lucy from julie's bicycle and we will share with you the invitation uh, quite soon so you can stay tuned if you want also to receive uh, more news from the Rock project and, and be informed about the next webinars, for instance, you can also subscribe to the Rock newsletters so you can find it on our website. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank you, thank our speakers and uh, for the great presentations and uh, the time they also spent to answer all the questions. And thank you also to the attendees who had a lot, a lot of very interesting questions. Uh, some challenging, some uh, very practical. So thank you very, very much. 
uh, and uh, I wish you all a very good day and uh, hope to see you soon in another rock webinar. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.